Talkeetna, Alaska. This vibrant little town is positively bursting with things to do, see, and experience. Thrilling adventure tours bring you face to face with the wild, natural beauty of the last frontier. And that's whether you're hitting the skies, the river, the trails, or even the canopy. Opportunities to learn about Alaskan history and culture abound. Simply strolling downtown is a walk through a page of Alaskan history. Throw in a lively music scene featuring local artists and songwriters, a foodie culture giving rise to a whole slew of good eats and brews, all of it laden with Alaskan charm and set to the backdrop of North America's tallest mountain. Here is our list of must-see, must-do things in Talkeetna, saving our absolute favorite for last. Strap on your adventure shoes and dive in with us. Our adventure starts with a jet boat tour up to the white water of Devil's Canyon. Yep, white water. Awesome, right folks here, we're gonna load up. You can follow Holly and I down. We're gonna load right off the back. Just take your time and go down single file, okay? Uh, start out with the introduction. My name is Israel. I'm going to be your jet boat captain for this trip. The lovely lady here, this is Holly, and I'm a second generation boat captain on the river. And uh, every day I get to go out and show people in my backyard. So we're going to have a good time out there, folks. Uh, boat is the McKinley Queen. We are being powered by three separate engines. They are Cummins turbo diesels, and we are pushing about 1,000 total horsepower. With this design, it's a very shallow draft vessel. This is pretty impressive, even though this boat weighs 19 tons. We'll need about 14 inches of water to run it. So here's where we're going. Talkeetna sits right here at the confluence of three glacially fed rivers, the Chulitna, the Susitna, and the Talkeetna. We are traveling 65 miles up the Susitna to experience the white water of Devil's Canyon. Na, the Denina Athabascan language means river. Susitna River that we're gonna be spending most of our time on today stands for river of sandy beaches and islands. And as we're going up the Susitna River today, you're gonna to see Israel navigating around a lot of these islands and sand and gravel bars. The current of this river does run about 10 miles an hour. Average depth of the river is about seven feet. We're gonna go over some spots that are a little more shallow than that, and a few places that are gonna be a little deeper than that. Our journey is leading us on a 130 mile round trip into the Alaskan wilderness. It is wild and remote, the only signs of civilization where the Alaska Railroad crosses the Susitna. Our guides are passionate about this area and teach us so much, like how the salmon swim all the way up here from the Gulf of Alaska. Israel even tells us stories about how his parents homesteaded here. Here we are, 51 years since my parents left this spot. And to this day, in this very spot, we're still seven miles from the closest road system, and there's still no electricity up here. Now the canyon walls start to close in and the river starts to change. It's swifter, choppier, and this is where we are grateful that Israel Mahay is our captain. His dad designed these boats and was the first person to navigate Devil's Canyon in a jet boat. The apple didn't fall far from the tree and Israel knows what he's doing. And we're here. This is intense. Some call Devil's Canyon the Mount Everest of Whitewater, and this is just the start of it. 
This rock is called the Devil's Horn, and only two people have ever made it past this spot. So there were two unsuccessful attempts to run Devil's Canyon before anybody made it successfully. Back in the 1950s, the Army Corps of Engineers attempted to run this in a 50-foot wooden boat. They actually sunk down below us. They didn't even make it this far into the canyon. Also, back in the early 1980s, the owner of Woolridge Boats, Glenn Woolridge, attempted to run this to promote his boats. And they sunk their boat at that rapid right out in front of us. That boat was never seen again. That Israel can keep us steady in white water like this is insane. And now we just wonder, how in the world are we going to turn around? Uh, very important to get you placed, remain seated on the way down. It does have the potential to be bumpier on the way down than on the way up, so do be forewarned. Also, it is a little technical turning around in here, so do please be patient. Fun isn't done just yet. It turns on this whole oh, oh, it's just all we are about to catch a glimpse of what life looked like in Alaska's not so distant past. Holly is showing us what a Denina fish camp looked like, where native Alaskans spent their summers catching, processing, and storing the salmon that filled the Susitna each season. Um, you're drying them out. The smoke is also going to keep a lot of the bugs off of the fish. And they're going to hang there till they're dried, and then they're going to be dry stored. And that's what this is. It's a ground cache. So if you'll notice the sticks in there, they're suspended up off the ground because you want to have, encourage airflow. When they're here in the summer, they're also trapping beavers. Behind you is a very primitive beaver trap. And that's called a deadfall. And here's an old trapper's cabin, a glimpse into a way of life that most of us can't even begin to relate to. Um, if you'll notice a couple things about the door, it's a very short door. There's a lot of space between the top of the door and the ceiling. And ladies, if you look inside, it's a dirt floor. One less thing we have to do, no sweeping. They would have one of these trapper cabins staged anywhere from every 15 miles, maybe every 30 miles. Depends on how long your trapper had been out here to build up their collection of trapper's cabins. Now, when they would finish skinning out the pelts and then tanning the hides and stretching the hides, they're gonna store everything in this amazing tree house. Anything and everything that was valuable to that trapper would go in the cache. One of the more practical things to trap, just like the Denina natives, your beaver. Beaver meat, again, extremely fatty. It's a great source of energy food, especially for your dogs. The pelt. Very practical. We still have ladies out here that can create magical things out of beaver. Beaver skin hats, over mitts, boots. Um, it's the third warmest pelt in the world, right behind your sea otter, river otter. And then you've got beaver. From the ways of the Denina to the trappers that came before even the railroad, it is so interesting to get this little peek into Alaska's past. This tour was awesome, and we recommend it 100%. In fact, we recommend all the tours we're taking you on. It's important to understand that our list of Talkeetna must-dos is not ordered by rank. You might ask then, why are we leaving our absolute favorite for last? Well, 
who doesn't like a little suspense in life? Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah, for that sure. That was really awesome. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Y'all have a great afternoon. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. If you come to Telkey, you, know, you have to do this. It's not even a question. Going back to town, it's a must. We're going to load up on Big Blue. Now, a stroll through historic downtown Talkeetna is a must-do experience in and of itself. Talkeetna was established in the early 1900s when this spot was designated as a district headquarters for the expanding Alaska Railroad. Talkeetna started as a tent town, and in the years that followed, buildings were constructed, many of which remain standing today. In fact, Talkeetna is home to so many historic buildings that an entire section of downtown is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Talkeetna Historical Society has a self-guided walking tour app that leads you through it all. Even history aside, Talkeetna is just a delightful place to walk around and explore. Quirky and down-to-earth, Talkeetna has a character all its own, and it really is set up as a great walking town. The train that was so instrumental in Talkeetna's formation still passes right through town. In fact, this is how many visitors get here today. Aboard the same historic railroad line that shaped Alaska's story, so deeply tied to the discoveries of gold throughout the region. And if that history intrigues you, you should definitely check out episode 7. And finally, Denali. North America's tallest peak can be seen right from a park right at the end of Main Street. On a clear day, Denali screams in the distance, soaring to an astounding 20,310 feet. Denali is only about 60 miles from Talkeetna as the crow flies, or airplane flies, and this town has one of the best vantage points. Just outside town, the pullout at mile 13 of the Talkeetna Spur Road is a must for Denali sightseeing. The view from here is simply epic. There is another place to catch some impressive views of Denali, from the treetops. It is a beautiful day in Talkeetna, and we are going to do something that at least I've never done before, which is a zipline tour. Super excited. We're meeting here at the booth downtown, and then we'll take the short shuttle ride up to the zipline. It's located on a hilltop just outside town. The guides are super nice, helping us get all suited up, then we get some training, learning how to brake and how to get ourselves to the platform if we brake a little too soon. And finally, we're ready to hit the course. Now, Jose Luis has zipped lined once before. I have never done this, so I truly have no idea what to expect. This is fun. The Denali Zipline Tour has nine runs, each one progressively longer and faster. The very last run has an extra something special, and we can't wait to show you that. And go. It is exhilarating to fly over and through the treetops. Not once do we feel unsafe. Our guides are great, confident and safety-minded, but also cracking jokes and sharing knowledge along the way. The course isn't just zip lines. It also includes three suspension bridges, which are super fun to try with no hands. We all feel like kids again, playing around in a giant grown-up treehouse. I had a few beers. You like? <laughs> <laughs> and all of us guests are becoming fast friends. Thank you. We got blueberries. <laughs> this is a nice treat. Blueberries. <laughs> I bet this is a good view on the clear days. Mm -hmm. It is. 
Yeah, so has anyone heard about the 30% Club? Yeah. Yeah. So 30% Club, if you haven't heard about it, is the amount of people who usually get to see Denali when they travel to Talkeetna. <laughs> but this year, it's probably more like the 2% Club. <laughs> But if it weren't cloudy, we would be able to see the entire Alaska range from here, from left to right. That includes wow. Mount Foraker, Mount Hunter, and Mount Denali. Ah, well, no Denali views today. But the zipline course makes up for it completely. It is so much fun. We're now at the part of the course with the big, long ziplines, now that we've started to get the hang of how to stick that landing. We're having such a blast, we could be at this all day, playing among the treetops. So enjoy the ride. This is one of my favorite zips because of how close we get to the tree. Yeah. Okay, you are good to go though. Okay. There is even a rappel spot, which involves putting a lot of trust in your equipment, your guides, and yourself. The second to last zipline is super fast and really fun. They are gearing us up for the grand finale, which passes right over a beautiful pond in the middle of the forest. Remote, secluded, crystal clear water. The only thing that would make this more Alaska would be a moose at the water's edge, which does happen sometimes apparently. Well, now we're hooked on zip lining, and the company has a course in Seward as well. We hope maybe we can make it onto that one. All in all, this zip line experience lasted three hours, and we loved every single minute of it. When in Talkeetna, you've got to enjoy the local nosh. For being such a small town, Talkeetna really shows up when it comes to good eats and local brews. And what better way to enjoy those local brews than to go straight to the source? Beer from the Denali Brewing Company can be found just about everywhere in Alaska. It's pretty awesome to get it right from the tap where it was cooked up. And you never know who you'll meet here. After our zipline day, we make some new friends and swap travel stories for a while. After a brief stint away, we're back in town with our nephew, Anthony, and we're now at the Denali Brewing Company's downtown spot. Same great brews and really good food. The atmosphere is great, laid back, a communal fireplace where we make some more new friends, and even Anthony too. We love this spot. If sweets are your thing, you cannot go wrong with Shirley's ice cream. Our personal favorite flavors are fireweed and the Northern Lights. I mean, you can get plain old vanilla anytime. When in Alaska, why not go for the local twist? No matter where you go in town, you'll find great food everywhere. You can even get a couple snacks at Negley's store and enjoy it in the park, soaking up the long daylight hours in this land of the midnight sun. morning. We are in beautiful Talkeetna, Alaska, a town that is near and dear to our hearts. And today we are going to go see sled dogs. We're going with the Alaska sled dog tours. We're so excited, especially excited about the puppies. You might be surprised to hear that dog sled tours run in the summertime. I mean, there's no snow, so how does that work? You shall see. We 
got our Nancy Anthony oh. yeah, visiting from Florida. Oh, very cool. Now this is your type of weather, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, come on in. She's going to be out on the trail with us today. Hey, Sarah. And Kennel owner Dallas Seavey and his dog team have won the Iditarod race five times, and that's no small feat. The race stretches a thousand miles from Willow to Nome. In fact, we saw the start of the race this year. You should definitely check out episode three if you're curious to know more about the Iditarod. The dogs need to stay fit in the summer, so they train with the cart. And this one has a special design. It's like a mountain bike. So like I said that um, Dallas innovates everything. He worked with the mountain bike company to create a cart like this so you guys can experience a little oh, bit of motion. Cool. So the driver will be standing up here and the rider will be here. And the number one rule in mushing is never let go. It takes a little while to hook the teams up, and we're told one of our lead dogs is the famous Gamble, a champion lead dog who led his first team in the Iditarod at age two. By the way, did you know that even though it's summer, you can still mush on snow? The CVs also do tours flying you up to a glacier to dog sled on snow in the middle of summer. That must be pretty amazing. Wow! It is amazing the power and energy the dogs have. And this is just a four dog team. Oh my god, they're going so fast. It is beautiful back here on the trail, and we can imagine how striking it must be in the winter. The history of dog sledding goes deep in Alaska. Even today, this is the limited scope of Alaska's transportation systems. You can imagine back in the day before the road system, before the railroad system, before the marine highway, before snow machines, and before planes, how did you get around? How did you access goods, medicines, supplies? Dog sled. The history of the Alaskan Husky and mushing is deeply ingrained in Alaska's story. In fact, even Denali National Park has a kennel of working dogs that allows rangers to access otherwise inaccessible parts of the park in the wintertime. How's it going there? Awesome! Anthony! Having fun, kiddo? Isn't that cool? They have so much power! Like Gamble's a really good leader, like come across a trail, say, that's like covered in snow, then you want a dog that's not going to be afraid to break trail and go jump through. But some dogs will be like, no, they don't want to lead, they're just not comfortable leading the rest of the team. Great slide, too. Can go see the kennels and puppies? Yeah. All right. Here we go. All right. Whoa. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we all have a special place in our heart for puppies. Tour visitors help socialize these little guys, and we are more than happy to be of service. You would like to have one, right, babe? Look at me. Ow! Train them to uh, tolerate, or <laughs> there is overflow. Um, and then, oh, they really like your microphone. Yeah. Okay, then tolerate, or Finally, we learn more about the Iditarod and how mushers like Dallas and his team care for the dogs during the race. 
we rely very much on our Iditarod Air Force. At each of these um, checkpoints, there's the vet, which we also have a vet log to attach to our sled. And if they say, hey, that wrist is looking a little sore, wrist is a minor injury in the dog world, so, but it can lead to bigger problems. So um, if you catch it right away, we're just gonna drop that dog, return, fly him down to Anchorage, and in Anchorage, they'll, um, us handlers will pick him up. These dogs can eat 15,000 calories a day, which to put it in comparison, a bear before hibernation can eat 20,000 calories a day. This is Dallas's parka. You wanna try it on? Yeah. Yeah, tell me how heavy it is. Whoa. <laughs> um, good. Does it feel heavy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This was a really interesting tour, one that allows you to brush shoulders with a piece of history and culture so ingrained not only in Alaska, but many other northern parts of the world. Next up is a rafting trip with Thalkeetna River Guides. You look awesome, dude. Look at you. <laughs> We're doing the two-hour tour, and we are super excited to find out what we'll see out there today. You look ready for the river. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the shuttle is taking us up the river a ways, and then we will float our way back to Talkeetna. <laughs> Ready for the river. Gonna cry when you're gone. Man, there is something about getting outside into the natural world, feeling the wind, noticing the little bits of beauty all around, and especially connecting with the flow of a river. The Talkeetna has already been on an 85 mile journey before reaching here, and I want you to pay close attention to the color of that water, because something really interesting is about to happen. This is a tributary flowing into the Talkeetna, and the difference between the two bodies of water is incredible. And why is that? Well, check this out. This is where the Talkeetna River is born. Say hello to Talkeetna Glacier. Glaciers are monumental forces of nature that pick up, chew, grind, and move a profound amount of rock as they flow down slope. So powerful is ice that glaciers carve U-shaped valleys just like a spoon skimming across ice cream. Just look how clear and defined that shape is here. Now, as glaciers chew up rock, they'll break it down so fine that they create what we call rock flour. When the glacier melts, this fine, fine powder washes into the river where it remains suspended, even 85 miles downstream where adventurous travelers raft its icy waters. That is why the Talkeetna looks so milky and this tributary does not. The tributary is not glacially fed, and so it is not chock full of fine, fine glacial flour like the Talkeetna is. Super interesting, right? Here we come across a beaver dam. It never ceases to amaze how these industrious creatures build structures capable of holding back the power of water. Right after seeing an eagle take off with a baby beaver, we see a familiar sight. The railroad bridge bringing the historic Alaska train into Talkeetna is our sign that we are almost home. 
We marvel at witnessing the exact moment the Talkeetna ends its 85 mile journey and becomes one with the Big Susitna. And we look back hoping we might be lucky enough to see Denali today. The mountains of the foreground came out to play, but not the great beast of the Alaska Range. Ah well, that's why they call it the 30% Club. And we're home. This tour was the perfect mix of nature, leisure, and sweet, sweet river time. Thank you. Man, what a ride. What a ride, right? We literally saw a, a eagle with a beaver, a baby beaver in his mouth. Crazy. Any visit to Talkeetna would be remiss without soaking up some of its musical flavor. Again, for such a small town, it has a delightfully vibrant music scene. In the summer, Live at Five takes place every Friday from 5 to 7 at the Talkeetna Village Park. The shows are free and family friendly. Visitors and locals alike convene at the park, lawn chairs and picnic blankets in tow. The vibe is so laid back and positive, it feels as if we're all just hanging out in the backyard together. If you're looking for a little more seclusion, then the Flying Squirrel is your place. Just five minutes from downtown, the Squirrel is the definition of cozy and homey, with great baked goods, coffee, and even wood-fired pizza nights. It makes the perfect venue for intimate acoustic shows put on by local and traveling musicians alike, and hey, you may recognize this particular traveling musician. You've got to check out what's on the playbill at the Sheldon Arts Hangar. This vibrant community space always has some bit of musical or artistic awesomeness up its sleeve. And finally, the Fairview. You cannot visit Talkeetna, Alaska without experiencing the Fairview. We love this place. It has such character, such history. To us, it really embodies the spirit of Talkeetna. And the music. The Fairview is a revolving door of great live acts, keeping the stage and the dance floor well used year round. In all of our travels all over the world, there's really no place like the Fairview. All right, it is time for the cherry on top of the sundae. For us, the ultimate must-do experience in Talkeetna. And that's to hit the skies. We're going out with Jason of Dancing Bear Alaska and Excited doesn't even come close to explaining how we feel. Oh, there's one coming back. No. One coming in. The tour takes off from the float plane station at mile 9 of the Talkeetna Spur Road. You can't miss it. This is a brand new experience for all three of us. If you want, I actually have a booster seat. Sit back in there and let me know if you want to get even higher. Alright, so hop up on that. You and Cora will be in the seatbelt together. Don't grab this door, which everyone does, because it just swings okay. right here. Best, best plane ride ever. <laughs> Denali, dead ahead. We cannot believe how lucky we have been to see this elusive peak so many gosh darn times. 
Once upon a time, Jose Luis wanted to be a pilot, so this is pretty exciting for him to be flying shotgun. Down below, we see the Susitna, calm and steady. If you didn't know, one might never imagine the way those waters rage through Devil's Canyon, 65 miles upstream. And then the mountains begin. The Alaska Range stretches 600 miles across the last frontier. Only three roads dare to cross it. We've taken you on all three of them in episodes 1, 5, and 15. The Alaska Range is the 10th tallest mountain range on Earth. And if you're curious how it forms, you got to check out episode 15. Glaciers course through the range, colossal beasts of ice that carve into the landscape, grinding up these mountains and sending the pieces out into the braided rivers of the Alaskan landscape. It is so difficult to describe what it is like here. Footage just doesn't do it justice. These mountains are so raw, so untamed, so utterly majestic, it's truly hard to find the words. So maybe let's just let the land speak for itself. Come, for just a little while, join us in these Alaskan skies flying among these giants of the natural world. I can't believe it, but we even watched the moment that a plane equipped with skis lands on a glacier. Down below, we see the famous Sheldon Chalet, one of the world's most remote luxury hotels. Can you imagine what it must be like to stay there? As if dropping down over a superhighway, we leave the range by flying over Ruth Glacier, which will go down in history, for me, as one of the coolest experiences in my life. Like poetry, all the pieces of our journey come together. There are the lush forests we blazed through with the dogs and flew through on the zip line. We see the confluence of the three rivers. There is the Chulitna, river of trees and sticks, meeting the Susitna, river of islands and sandbars. And there is the Talkeetna, river of plenty, pouring its silty glacial waters into the Big Sioux. From up here, we see that the funky little town of Talkeetna is just one little piece of a greater story, of a greater treasure, this land. We leave here humbled and grateful we could bring you along and spend just a little sliver of our lives visiting a place of such unimaginable power and beauty. You can still take Hey guys, 
If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a like. Subscribe to our channel. Send us a comment below. And for exclusive content and a behind the scenes view of the Art View Day journey, join us on Patreon. See you over on Patreon.